Tonight's top EU stories from the unit website include Prime Minister pledges to crush Tories' bid to quit the EU early. Abolishing the Synod will put us firmly under the EU's control. European Union extends Democratic Republic of Congo support missions. And German Eurosceptics cost Merkel her majority. Plus, millions of Britons face a winter of power cuts. I'm Rick Timmis and this is the unit nightly news. Welcome to the bicentennial episode of the Unit Nightly News. Yes, folks, this is the 200th edition. One thing that has struck me over the course of preparing and delivering this show is the incredible amount of unseen power the EU holds. The nation-state has been duped into this so-called economic union, which is in reality much more like the old Soviet Union in power and structure. Now, don't get me wrong, I am a pro-European, but only if it is truly democratic and something that the people were actually asked if they wanted, all of which brings me rather nicely round to today's first story. So, from our homepage. David Cameron moved last night to crush a bid to hold a referendum on British membership of the EU next year as the Tories were pitched into fresh turmoil on Europe. Tory backbencher Adam Afrayi, who has been accused of plotting against Mr Cameron, announced plans to table an amendment to legislation which paves the way for a promised vote in 2017. Mr Afrayi, who is reputed to have 25 supporters lined up for a future leadership bid, said the public was not convinced Mr Cameron would stick to his promise. He revealed he will give MPs the chance to vote for a referendum in 2014 instead of when Tory James Wharton's referendum bill is debated next on November the 8th. And this demonstrates so well what a deceitful liar Chairman Cameron really is. When asked via a public petition with well over 100,000 signatures, Le Bon Premier crushed the debate in Parliament, going on to attempt to sweep the issue under the carpet. As pressure mounted, he curtailed with a maybe we will in five years' time, if I am re-elected. But now, as pressure for a simple enactment of the British people's democratic rights is tabled, he's off again. Who does this Etonian upstart think he is? Perhaps then we have got his name wrong. Perhaps it's not Cameron. It's probably Chavez. The government decision to abolish the Senate is essentially at odds with the reform-based strategy so far presented to us by this government. True, it was included in the government programme, but from the outset clear and emphatic reasoning has been conspicuous by its absence. The real source for abolition was Europe. It derives at least in part from the strong bonds of attachment that Ender Kenya and his government have formed with the EU. They did this out of the strife and shame of the previous Fianna Fáil administration to become the good boys of Europe. Uh, they recognise that abolition will further diminish the state and will put us more firmly under greater EU control in the future, in conformity with measures already contained in two of the protocols to the Lisbon Treaty. Now, this article is a classic example of hiding the truth in plain sight. It initially reads with little to no impact, almost as though it were more Euro Bureau red tape. However, it is not that at all. It is a very, very serious piece. Let's just take a little rewording of the article. The Irish government's decision to abolish the Irish Parliament in a reform strategy as part of its conformity with the Lisbon Treaty. <laughs> now, doesn't that make it a different article? The article then goes on to say, This is being done without explanation to the people. The protocols which relate to the governments and parliaments are in treaty form, but the motive for abolition is certainly not being explained to the direct context of Europe as a force behind the Sinead ab ab abolition and many other judicial reform proposals coming from the EU. Doesn't it strike you as odd? The Irish people are a fiercely independent nation. They battled for decades against assimilation into the United Kingdom, funding and supporting the IRA to support those aims. And yet it has been carried to the sacrificial EU altar like a sleeping lamb.
The Council of the European Union said Monday it extended two security programs for the Democratic Republic of Congo for the last time. The Council said on Monday it extended a mandate for a European Union Police Force advisory mission in DRC. The year-long mandate is aimed at assisting with security sector reform in the country. A separate mission provides assistance for Congolese authorities working on national defence issues. Combined, the two missions are allocated $20 million in funding through to September 2014. Well, you really couldn't make this up. What fortuitous timing. Put your laughing gas masks on, folks. The kleptocrats must be putting something in the water trying to get away with this one. Only yesterday, a report from our sources highlighted news that the DRC government had taken EU monies and given their own government ministers an 800% pay rise. So what do our learned brainiacs in the Bruswellian Parliament do? Stitch you and me up for another $20 million to continue funding until 2014. Perhaps we should send old Rumpoy and Barroso down to Athens for a whip round. They can explain the importance of this money for the Congo at the same time. Well done, Angela Merkel. The German Chancellor has just lost her centre-right parliamentary majority. What, I hear you say? Wasn't this a historic third election victory for a woman now being widely compared to Margaret Thatcher? In one important sense, that is true, though not in the comparison with Maggie Thatcher, which is tosh. Merkel will almost certainly be Chancellor as her Conservative bloc scored 41.5% of the votes, way ahead of anybody else. But in another important sense, this is not a victory for Angela Merkel or the German right at all. Her free democratic former partners in coalition failed to cross the 5% threshold necessary for parliamentary representation. If you add up the votes among the parties that made it into Parliament, Social Democrats on 26%, Greens on 8.4%, Left Party on 86 6 percent and the left has actually beaten the right. Well, Merkel should still take the chancellorship, but she will need the help of the left in order to govern. This article looks at the compromises that will entail. Britain faces a real risk of blackouts this winter because reserve supplies of electricity are running dangerously low, experts warned last night. The National Grid's Winter Outlook report reveals they stand at just 5%, almost half last year's level and the lowest since 2007. It has raised fears that millions of homes may be plunged into darkness this winter. Ian Fells, Emeritus Professor of Energy Conservation in Newcastle, said the country faces a very serious situation. He said a reserve margin of 20% was generally regarded as necessary for safety. Anything lower raised the risk of blackouts. Professor Fells said this is a dangerously low margin and reveals a real risk of things running out. Even with a margin of 20%, reserves are stretched during a very cold spell and could run out. If there is a problem with power stations, this margin just isn't enough. He said the network was having to rely on power stations which could have been closed and replaced. The government has known about this issue but done nothing about it. Nobody is building new power stations and we will have to rely on coal-fired plants when they are supposed to have been closed down. Today in our video library... Adam Afrihi talks on Sky News about his proposed amendments in regard to giving the people a referendum on Europe. In this piece, he states quite accurately that no one, no one, in Britain has ever been asked if they wanted to join the European Union. Sure, there are those of us that were asked if they wanted to join the European Economic Community, called at the time the Common Market. But that sounds much more like the arrangement taken up by Norway. What we got was a series of deceitful treaty agreements. Thatcher, the Single European Act, Major, the Maastricht Treaty, Cook, the Nice Treaty, Blair, the European Constitution, and Brown, the Lisbon Treaty. Together, these treaties sign over all significant political and sovereign powers to the European Union. Surely you would have thought that as elected representatives of the people, one of these ministers would have thought about asking the British people if they wanted this. Well, apparently not. It appears there is some magic incense in 10 Downing Street that imbibes our leaders with divine insight into the collective mind of the British people. And our chairman, sorry, Prime Minister, well, frankly, he knows what is best for people like you and me. 
I'm Rick Timmis, reporting for the unit, Nightly News. I'll see you soon. <laughs>